right, I'm live. I'm on my webcam today and I'm sitting in my dining room. So hope you're all having a fantastic day. And this is the first Tuesday of uh, streaming and I'll be doing watercolor on this Tuesday stream. And um, I haven't done watercolor for a while, so I thought it would be a good opportunity to start off from the beginning. I know a lot of you would love to do watercolor, but you're not too sure how to start or what to get. And so I thought this would be a great way of having you join me in my revisiting of watercolor. So today I've got just a simple pans of, um, these are uh, Canadian, Canadian, these are <laughs> our um, student grade and artist grade, different types of uh, watercolor. I get mine from a tube and then I'll put them in a um, pan that I get from Amazon. So for me, I don't necessarily get all of the one brand and stick to that. I get colors that are what I use most of that maybe another manufacturer doesn't have. So I've got a real mix of different. Mine are usually uh, Daniel Smith, Windsor Newton Core. Um, What else? Holbein, I think. I think that's about it. Hey, Nancy. Hi, Dot. So this is the first day of the watercolor day. I'm going to have Tuesdays as watercolor. So watercolor and sketch, that type of thing. So whoever wants to, I have had a lot of people request watercolor. So I thought it would be easier just to um, designate one particular day on doing just watercolor. So we'll see how it goes. If we get enough response, see how, how the um, people like it. So how's everybody doing? And uh, what do you want to learn in watercolor? Leave, leave um, comments in the comments below afterwards, too, because I would really like to know what is it that you want to learn? What are you having difficulties with? And maybe we can investigate these things together and see if we can figure things out. So I've got two types of paper here. This is the fluid, the one we get in Canada here. Not sure, I'm, I would imagine you can get it in the States too. And this is just a nine by 12 and this is hot pressed. Hey, Rhonda, I need help with flowers. Okay. So as you can see, or maybe you can't, it's very smooth, very, very smooth. There's very little texture on this at all. This is a block. So what that means is that it's sealed. This one is only on two sides. The, the um, other sides are not. Hey, Ray. The other type of paper you can get is cold press. And cold press, um, you can probably see a little bit of a texture in that. And cold press, a lot of artists use this mainly for what they do because it lets the water sit in the area because of the texture. Whereas the hot press, which is very, very smooth, it, it 
kind of sits on the top for a little bit longer. Hey, Lena. So it doesn't soak in quite as fast, whereas this does. Now you can also get um, different weights. So this is um, 140 pound, and it's kind of, it's a little um, thicker than cardstock. And I use this mostly for practicing on. Um, if you want to do something that's going to be framed later, you might want to go to your 300 pound. And that is very, very thick. And it's less likely that it will buckle. Uh, whereas these, you really should either pre-stretch it, which is um, using uh, soaking your paper in water and then putting it, taping it down onto a substrate and letting it dry. Or you can just tape these down with a masking tape or there are artist tapes out there that you can get also. It's up to you. Um, now I know there are some people that actually like to soak these and then put them on a piece of plexiglass or glass itself and keep it wet. So they're using it as wet into wet. But for today, it were, I just thought it would be a good idea to talk about the paper, some of the brushes that I have, and the paint. And then start off simple by how to use the water and the paint together. Um, different types of um, brushes hold different amounts of water also, which is your pigment once you add your pigment to your water and brush. And it's, um, it's a totally different way of painting because with watercolor, you need to think about your highlights and your lightest areas and where they're going to be because you cannot paint those in afterwards. So you have to leave those. So the white of your paper is your highlights basically. Um, now there are different things that you can put on your paper, such as um, a frisket and um, even, uh, what's it called? Gum Arabic, that type of thing. So it's almost like a Oh, what's that glue? <laughs> I can't think of it. Cement glue. Some people have actually used that too. So the cement glue will be put on before you paint. And you got to make sure it's good and dry before you put any kind of water or paint on top of it. And do not use a hair dryer to uh, dry your Arabic. <laughs> It's, you'll never get it off your paper again. It'll actually bake it into your fibers of your paper. So just keep that in mind. It's best to let your watercolor dry naturally without a heat gun. Now, some people do use heat guns, but I find that most of those people are, are you usually doing more of a illustrative type of art than your multi-layered um, rubber cement, that's it, yeah. Um, then your multi-layered uh, watercolor. Um, or also, you can also use it with your pen and ink. And that's more urban sketching type of uh, style. There's very, very um, huge amount of styles in watercolor. So it depends on where you are intending to go with this. Do you want to be a, a purist in watercolor where that's all you use? You don't add any gouache or acrylic paint to it or color pencil, that type of thing. Um, or is it just going to be something for your sketchbook? Maybe you're, you've got a watercolor sketchbook and you're going to be doing um, quick sketches with a, just a little bit of color to it. 
then that's fine too. It, there's so many styles of watercolor. I would suggest um, reading up on it and to see what what is the style that uh, attracts you the most. Um, and don't be hesitant to try that style or work towards that style. Because the fun of it is the process of, of getting there, not um, expecting to be an expert at it right off the bat, because you're not going to be. It takes practice. And that's the fun of art, is the practice to get there and being present with your art and letting the art take you in <laughs> so that it's you don't think anything else while you're doing it. Um, I like botanical illustration myself, tend to use a dry technique. Yeah. So you probably use a lot of um, hot pressed dot. Um, most botanical illustrative people use a hot press because it's more of a um, very detailed fine work. It's not a lot of large wash wet into wet. Um, there is a bit, but not as much as... Um, a regular watercolorist. <laughs> yeah, rubber cement. Is that what you use? I have used it, but uh, I, I think I prefer um trying not to use it at all because it does it does take the finish off your paper slightly it depends how you know perfect you want it yes you use hot pressed so i thought today um what we'll do is give you a little bit of information on um the watercolor itself and how different it is towards anything else like I know when I first started into watercolor even before I did watercolor I was very very leery about it because it is such a different medium to work with and you have to have um you don't have to have really expensive brushes especially when you're just starting out these are um silver black velvet they're called and I think these are probably one of the best paint brushes to start off with um, even for um, professionals use these and they're not gonna <laughs> you don't have to get a mortgage to basically buy these and I, I think if you're gonna start I would probably get um, this is an eight so either a six or an eight and that will probably do a lot of your work. The only other size you could probably get would be a, a large mop brush if you're going to do a lot of white or uh, wet into wet. Um, no, I use frisket, but almost never. Yeah. When you um, get your brushes, like this is not a pure fur or hair brush. It's a synthetic. So there are some really fantastic synthetic fiber brushes out there for watercolor. The only thing I say, if you do get watercolor brushes, keep them specifically for watercolor. Do not use them with acrylic or any other type of medium because they will damage the um, hairs in the near the um, ferrule of the brush. It's very hard to get acrylic out of these fine haired brushes. So just keep, keep a few just for watercolor. Um, but buy the expensive because they're awesome. <laughs> I eat bologna for weeks. <laughs> 
they are nice. And they now oh, there's so many different um, types out there too, and every type of hair um, holds water differently. So I would strongly recommend try these first or one similar to it just to get the feel of how this watercolor moves for you. And um, there are a few, uh, I guess I could say rules, <laughs> depends on what you want, but there are a few things that you have to keep in mind when you're doing watercolor. And that is um, the one thing is do not go back. On, when you're painting, I will show you, uh, first, I better get some water. I'll just hold on while I go get some water. So I hope you don't mind me starting from the start, but I did. I do have a lot of people that really um, wanted to start from the very start of things. And I can see why, because I know how that felt when I first started out on it. Uh, mimic brushes at Jerry's are really nice. Yes, I, ha I do have a mimic brush that Xandra gifted me a, quite a while back. And they are, they're probably both very similar to these. Yes, they're and they're not too expensive either. Thanks, Rhonda. Yes, I love the mimic brushes too. Yeah. So um, with watercolor, um, I didn't bring my spray bottle up. Let's see. I'll do. I'll just wet some of these greens and blues. Put some water in there just to get them wet. Now these are pans of watercolor from the tube. You can get uh, pans that are already done for you. They're not in a tube, they're already in a pan. So it's up to you what you wanna purchase. I like the tubes myself. I think you get a little more for your money in them. And there's different styles of painting with watercolor um, that you need a more pigmented um, brush and therefore using it directly out of the tube while it's still wet um, is what you need. So you, with the tube, you kind of have two ways of, of using it. Uh, my very best brushes are handmade. I watched them. Oh, awesome. Yeah, there's some fantastic brushes out there. Now, you always want a little, either a paper towel or some people like using um, a cotton rag or that type of thing. It's up to you. And with, if you have a um real hair like a Kalinsky or squirrel or something like that it takes a little bit longer for your hairs to soak up the water so you want to put your brush in the water probably for a few a minute or so just so that it soaks up the water and that will tell you that you've got the full working ability of that brush then Hey, Red. Awesome. Thanks for uh, joining in. Oh, great. Well, every Tuesday, we're going to be working our way through this. So this is a um, cold press watercolor paper. And this is just a uh, very inexpensive water paper. It's the Strathmore watercolor paper in the brown. I think that's the 
400 series. I can't remember. I don't have it up here with me, but it's the brown um, cover colored watercolor. Um, probably some of you probably know what uh, series that is. But for just um, trying watercolor, because there's no point in you going out and buying the most expensive of paper and uh, and brushes and paint if you don't really know if you're going to like it. Now, if you want to, you can also start off, if you don't want to get into any of these um, paints here from the tube, you can get a Koi set. Great for starting out. Now this is a Koi set. And it comes in its own little house. <laughs> and this is great for even taking on the run with you. And you can put a little, get a little brush. This is a water brush, but if you're going to start, if you really want to learn how to watercolor, do not start off with these. They aren't the proper brushes to use for um, true watercolor painting. They're all right if you're using um, a quick sketch and wash type of thing. But these are great to start off with and then they're not going to break the bank. It's 400 series, thanks. Yeah, I thought it was the 400. Thanks, Janet. Okay, and you get uh, one, two, three, one, two, two, four, six. So twenty-four colors. I'm not sure what they are right now. This is this one's ages old, but you get a little palette with it, and um, can't remember if you get a brush with it or not. But try that out first before you get into the real expensive watercolors because they can run quite a bit of money depending on which um, manufacturer you're going to invest in. Okay, so there's many types and ways of doing watercolor. Um, but they're all the same. All the water reacts to the paper. So um, we have, I got some blue here. Now there's wet onto dry. There's wet into wet. There's uh, wet um, With salt, there, there's so many ways of doing this. And most illustrative types of art is done wet on dry. So wet on dry means your wet brush on a dry piece of paper. And it's, it's just very, you just keep doing whatever shape you're going to be doing. It's very simple. There's there's no um, rocket science involved in this. The only thing about this is do not go back into your area that you just painted. Because as this starts to dry and you start going into this again and keep going over it, over it and over it, eventually you're going to get a very uneven wash of paint. And if your and if your brush is wetter than your um, paper in the area that you just painted, and you put a really wet brush back into it, you're going to get this thing called a bloom. And what it is is that the fresh water that you put in the paint will suddenly rush and push your pigment of the paint that you just put down out of the way. So it's kind of being like a bully. <laughs> It's just pushing all that pigment away and you'll get this um, hard 
kind of a frilly edge of paint. This is probably, I've seen one of the most um, often seen mistake that um, new beginners do is they, they re keep, <laughs> keep picking at it and you can't, you have to leave it alone. Don't pick at your, <laughs> your painting. You have to be direct and yes, I'm going to put it there. <laughs> Now, uh, a lot of people have a real problem doing watercolor on the flat of your table. They usually have it so that it's on a slant. And that is the best way, especially um, if you want nice washes, to have a really nice, even bit of color. You do need... A lot of water on your brush and you need to put your um, paper on a, a bit of a slant. When you're doing a wash you want to start and then take that little bead of watercolor that's kind of falling on the edge there and you just keep the tip of your brush on that bead of water and you just keep bringing it down. So you're guiding that little bead of water down your, your page. And you just keep it on an angle because even though you're finished painting, this water is still mo moving in the paper. <laughs> so what we'll get, as it dries, you'll see that it gets smoother and smoother. And this watercolor will dry lighter. So you have to keep that in mind too. If you want a specific color, it will be lighter. So you may need to go a little bit darker. Hey Beth, welcome. You just have to do it, Beth. It, you'll get confident the more you do. With art, you have to make mistakes in order to succeed. Pretty well anything you do. So don't don't look at it as, you know, you failed and I'm never going to do it again. No, you've just learned something. You learned what not to do or that didn't work. And you just keep doing it until you get it right. And I'll, there are some great times where you do it and you find these happy accidents. <laughs> so just have fun with it. Okay, so if you're starting out, I would like you to practice doing washes. So I'm going to put some more of this color in here. And... When you're doing watercolor, it's always best to have a palette. And you can have a, a white dish or a glass palette, or if you have one of these, this is great too. And this is where you'll do all your mixing. You don't try not to do your mixing on your paper. Now, some artists get away with it and they do fantastic stuff. But to start, mix on your palette. So you mix on your palette, then to your paper. And don't go from your, your pan, which these are pans. Do not go from your pan to your paper. Because you'll never know the um, intensity of the pigment that's on your brush. So you can kind of see if you want your pigment to be um, fairly deep. And pigmented now this is a fairly light but if I want it even lighter then I know I can 
dip my brush in the water and add it. And this should be a little bit lighter. Just play with pigments. See how light you can get it. Hey, Jersey. Now, I know that can get pretty boring doing these um, swatches, I guess you could call them. So if you have a bunch of stencils and if you're at all into mixed media, you probably have a, a billion of them, <laughs> get some stencils out. Get a paper or a pencil. Just to practice, because the more you get this thing down on how to control the, the wash that you're laying down, the easier it will be for you to do um, correct washes when you're doing, say, flowers and you need a specific um, amount of pigment on an area. Some are light, some are dark. This will help you. So draw a bunch of these. You can use, like, there's so many. Get something that's very wide open. Like this letter stencil would probably even work. So just trace around the open areas and then uh, practice. And what you can also do is I've got that blue. So let's do a nice green. And I'm going to put a green over here. What you can do, too, is we can combine two colors as a gradient. So we got this nice blue. And we're going to make sure you see the water on my ferrule. You don't want that. So take a paper towel, Kleenex, whatever, and wipe off your ferrule just a bit. You can even just dip your brush so you don't have big drops of water coming out. Too much water isn't good either. So this is, it's a, it's like a Goldilocks thing. You have to find the right consistency of water and pigment. So you just, and try and remember not to go over your your previously painted areas. So you want to get it as even as you can. So try to do that. And see the little dot. If you find you have a dot of concentrated color, take your brush, clean it, wipe your brush with your paper towel, and then just Dip your brush on that one area and it'll pick up that little dot. So try and do a bunch of these. Let's do some green. And it, it just helps you learn how to get a nice, consistent color down without too many um, blotches. There's another little bit of color that I don't want. If you leave that color there, it'll be darker. And if there's a lot of water, that's where you'll get a bloom. I will leave um, I think I'll do one and leave it so you can see what I'm talking about. Let's do one sideways.
I'm going to leave that and I'll show you what happens. Um, about the angle and tilt slant or what? Just slight nod to gravity. Yeah, the um, have it about mm, not a lot, just just a slight amount. So put a little towel on, under it, like it's maybe twenty percent tilt, twenty five percent tilt. Whatever you're comfortable with, um, you don't want it something like this because it can be very. Then you have prop, especially when you're a beginner, you have problems keeping up with that um, bit of water that's left on the edge. See, when you have it tilted, you're not going to get as much of a bloom. But if you notice, see how I put it back and the water is rushing back in that dot? So the other pigment around it that doesn't have as much water is going to dry faster. So where that concentrated area is, as the outer area dries faster, it pushes into that area and causes what they call a bloom. Okay. Let's see if we can do a bit of a gradient. I'm going to just put some blue on here. And then I'm going to turn it around and I'm going to use some green. And I'm just going to touch that blue. Now we want to suck this up a little bit because we don't want that coming back. We want a very soft. See how it's soft? It's not really competing. Now let's do one that goes into the other and, and actually changes the center color. Get a little bit more. Just taking it down, and I'm going to go into the blue. Take some of this out. Now, if I go into it, let's see what it does. So I'm going to be fiddling with it. Now this one wasn't too bad because it it was all pretty well the same water consistency. You see you got a different color but it's it's a gradient into each other. Okay. So what I want you to do too is 
um, get some lines down if you want, or if you don't want to do lines, you don't have to. It's up to you. This is just practice, just so that you'll learn how the water acts. This is totally different. It's all about the movement of the water and how it reacts to the paper you're using. Oh, I had something on the paper. See that? This here? There was something on my paper. Now, I didn't see it, but can you see how it's actually had a reaction with the paint in the water? So that's another thing you have to think about is if you're wearing any kind of lotion on your hands, do not touch your paper because it will cause a resist to your paper. So make sure your papers are stored in a safe area where they're not getting um, touched by anything. No, this is just wet onto dry. It's just my brush. Now with Wet into wet, we'll try that. With wet into wet, wherever you wet your paper, that is where the paint will go. It will not go past that wet area. Um, so I just put down. I don't know, my phone just. <laughs> I don't know if you can see it. You can see a little bit of their gloss. That's how wet my paper is. So then I'll take some paint and you can either, depending on what you're doing, you can either just tap the paint in and it will flow into that water, but you'll get an uneven um, pigment look. Or you can take it and do the same thing. But because you have the water, and if you put it on an angle, the water will guide it. And you can play with it by tilting your paper. This is a, um, probably the, the most fun about watercolor is when you're using your wet into wet. Now you'll get little um, drips of water falling up to where you stop that water that you placed first. So you can just take the tip of your brush and soak it up. So it doesn't um, have a run back, they call it. Back went to get the first piece of Christmas. <laughs> you still got Christmas cake. Are you putting any, um, let's see. It's fun to think out of the box, Joey. I've been playing with metallic fabric paint on paper just because I can. <laughs> yep. Just play with it. Play with all of your stuff and see how it reacts. Um, every paper's different. Here, I'll show you. This is a uh, hot press paper. So with hot press paper, the water doesn't soak in as fast. So we'll just do a, a wet into dry. And it's uh, much more smoother looking. You're not going to get yeah. 
see how the lines are much um, crisper, I guess you could say. Now, if I was to do a wet into wet with this, we'll just do an area here. You don't want it sopping wet. So you want to let it sit for a, just a little bit for it to start to soak into the paper slightly. And then you take your color. And it sits on the top of your paper more than the cold pressed. So it's a little harder to control, I find, when doing wet into wet. See how it sits on top a little longer? So for wet in wet technique, cold press is probably best for you unless you like a lot of blooms and stuff. Okay, so here's that, see the little bit of water, how concentrated the pigment is. Um, I, there's a very, very slight bloom happening. See, there's a darker edge right in here. This isn't a bad one, but it's called a bloom. See how it's still sitting? That wet into wet is still sitting there. So if you're doing a lot of wet into wet painting, stick to your cold press. This is more for illustrative and most of the illustrative paintings are done wet into dry, meaning the paper is dry. Uh, a lot of urban sketching is done on this type of paper because they're not putting um, as many layers on either. Okay, any questions? Now I'll show you uh, what that other is like. So this is just the koi. I guess we'll do some red here. So I'm just going to wet. Sometimes you have to wait a couple minutes for this to soak into the paints. The nice thing about watercolor is too, this old watercolor that's been sitting here for weeks, it reconstitutes. So I like having <laughs> sometimes some mixes here already for, especially if I'm doing um, any kind of flowers or landscapes. A lot of times these dirty colors are just the color you need. So don't clean up your pans um, all the time. Because a lot of times too, if you not finished your watercolor painting, you're going to want to go back to those colors when you go back to it. And if you wiped out your palette, you, you don't have the same color anymore. So it's always best to have a little bit more mixed up than not enough. So these are great. So this is, um, I'll do it on this paper here. And they're just as good to use as your artist grade. And that was just the very watery mix there. So if I'm using, let's do some red here. They're fairly pigmented. 
and they're great just to get used to the way the water flows off your brush. So practice a bunch of circles or squares. See what you can, how smooth of a gradient you can do. So just remember, as long as your paper is still wet, and it hasn't um, gone matte looking, see, see how you see it's still wet? So you can still work with that. But once there's no sheen to it at all, then leave it alone because you'll end up causing blooms and all kinds of uh, marks if you wanted something fairly smooth looking. So let's see, if I put, if I go into this, you can lift some too by just taking your brush and wetting it. And then you can lift too. Some paint is a little more staining than others. So it depends on the paint you're using also. Don't rub it, just dab. So let's do a square here in water and then let's try Green. Nice. And to make a nice grit, gradual, smooth. Look to your paint, put it on a bit of an angle. It doesn't have to be a lot, but a bit of an angle will help. And then just make sure you get those drips at the very end so they don't bloom back on you. All right, so there's some ideas for you. But get some stencils out. And there's all different types, but find something that got a fairly large opening. So I have some here. This I thought would be kind of cool. So these are like stained glass church windows. You could do with a smaller brush these, and you just draw them out. Then there's the letters you can practice with. So just draw around your letters and you've got different shapes to practice. Or these, these are the bricks. And there's this one here. So you just draw them and then try and practice painting all of these. So I would suggest getting a big piece of paper or cut a bunch of small ones and draw these out and then do one paper or more, depending on how much you want to do. Try to do even gradients of watercolor for each of these. And then the good thing about this too, it helps you with your brush um, work as far as keeping inside the lines. So if you want to be very detailed for illustrative, flowers or whatever you're doing, you need to practice how to be accurate in keeping your brush within the lines. So this, and it, this is a little more interesting than <laughs> just a square to do. But yeah, so this is a short video, but I just wanted to start you off with this and give you a little bit of um, homework to do. So get some paper, and like I said, the 400 series of uh, Strathmore is absolutely fun.
fine to start off with for practicing. Don't get into your expensive watercolor paper right off the bat. It's it's too much money just to practice on. This, uh, this other watercolor will do just fine. So I'm just going to leave you with that, and we'll see you next week, same time, same day, and we'll be starting um, doing some brush strokes and um, some color combinations, how to um, do leaves, say maybe we'll do some leaves, we'll draw some leaves, and we'll um, integrate two different colors together so that they look like they're combined and, and multi-colored. Um, and if you have any suggestions at all, please leave a comment in below and I'll get right back to you. And also I'll have some, um, give me some ideas of what you want to learn. All right. So thanks for coming, guys, and we'll see you next week.